purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, I'm looking above, filled with his goodness, filled with his goodness, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, and I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Holy Father, we thank you. We live, we move, we function only because of thee. Some believe that somehow without a God they are existing. But the truth is there is no way possible that all things could remain in order and as they do, unless somebody kept them. We want to thank you this morning. Thank you for the ability to speak, to hear, to eat. The things we take for granted, Lord, until we lose them. We want to thank you for them. We want to thank you for family members and friends. If there's someone here, Lord, that has been mistreating their moms and fathers, help them to know they have been blessed to still have them with them, and may they bless them and be a blessing to them. If there are those who are struggling financially here this morning, Lord, teach them that if they would learn to trust Thee, trust Thee a little more, and give, for it shall be given unto them. And it's more blessed to give than receive. Bless us in a special way. Visit us. And remind us, give us one of those occasions that we won't forget. And we can truly say, God was in our midst. We thank you this morning, this evening. Amen. Amen. What a privilege it is to be here. New life. That's what everybody needs, right? A new life in Christ Jesus. It's wonderful to be here. Pastor Fernandez, thank you for the invite. Somebody put in his ear to tell me to get over here and... Um, he did it. Amen. I want to appreciate, I appreciate all of you. Missed all of you. Love all of you. Some of your new faces that don't know you, still love you. Amen. Amen. You love too, right? We love like Jesus loves. Jesus loves all. Amen. It's great to be here. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about Jesus. Um, one reality, that's the leader of the church, is one reality that the church can never forget, and that is that Jesus is our leader. You cannot forget this reality. Amen? Amen? I'm going to use the book of Matthew to introduce this reality because we got some people here that maybe don't even open your Bibles. But I want to use the book of Matthew because Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. He introduces to us the Messiah. His theme is that Jesus is the King. Amen? That's his theme. And he uses many different titles. I mean, in the first four chapters, he gives, shares at least 20 different titles for Jesus. You just look in the passage. 
But I'm going to try and spin it a little bit and share it with you and bring some interest to it. It's the first book, the initial book of the New Testament. So when you're reading it, keep that in mind. Matthew's, Matthew's audience was a Jewish audience, and his idea, his theme is, I want them to recognize Jesus is the king. And that's the same thing for you this morning. Not only is he the king, he's the savior. He's the light of the world. He's whatever you need. He is all and in all. But Matthew does a tremendous job. It's like holding a big diamond in his hand, and he's going to be spinning it around. I'll share it with you in just a moment. Before I get into that, I just want you to know God has been good to me. Amen? Amen. He has been good to me personally. So sometimes when you come to church, you're coming to get something. Listen, church, don't come to get. Come to give. Amen. Amen? If you come to give, you couldn't be disappointed because there's a lot of people still coming to get. Amen? Amen? If every one of us is coming to get, who's going to get anything? Because all of us have our hands out to get. Why don't we all come to do what? Give. I think we can get some from it. Amen? Amen? So I came to give, and I hope you came to give, but I'm going to be giving something to you, and I pray you will receive it this morning. Matthew is in his own book. Amen? The author of the book of Matthew is in Matthew. Turn to Matthew 9.9. 9. He's in there. I want you to see his story and see how his heart is, is entwined with his book. Amen? Matthew 9.9. 9. Jesus is walking along, and he sees this guy working in a receipt of customs, and his name is Matthew. And guess what Jesus says to this guy? Come, follow me. It's a powerful thing. Do you know who Jesus was and is? This is God coming past a guy. And if you don't know, Matthew was a tax collector. And a tax collector to a Jew was the equivalent of a person here in the United States who you would find out, maybe if they're your next door neighbor, you were talking to them and they say, I love the Taliban. You know what the Taliban is? They're terrorists, right? And if you tell your, if your neighbor tells you and you know every year or every day or every month I'm sending money to them, you might not like your neighbor, right? Because he, he's helping terrorists. Amen? Well, Matthew worked with the Roman, he worked with the Roman government. And the Romans to the Jews were terrorists. They were terrible people. In fact, 90% of the people at the time when Jesus was here were in slavery. The Romans were some tough people. In fact, the book of Daniel says when Rome would rule, it would rule and crush like iron and steel, and it would crush people, the Roman time. So Matthew was in cahoots with them, and here comes this rabbi, and he says what? Come, follow me. Two simple words, follow me. Two simple words, follow me. Me. And so Matthew puts himself in his book. And I want you to look at this because the next verse, Matthew 9, 10, the next verse, a party is thrown. Guess who's throwing the party? Matthew is throwing the party. He invites all of his friends, which are not Christians. Amen. Amen. This is an evangelism, right? He comes to Jesus in 9, 9, the next verse, guess what he does? He throws a party. Am I wrong or right? Let me see. Am I wrong or right? Y'all with me? He throws a party. All of these sinners, all of these what? Sinners are there. Because if you keep reading, if it's not that verse, the next verse says some people were checking it out and they said, why does your master eat with all these people, these publicans and who? Sinners. Because Jesus, who is God in flesh, loves sinners. Amen. So if you're a sinner, you don't have to become good for God to love you, nor good for God to call you. It's a faithful saying, 1 Timothy 1.15, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, in whom Paul writes, I'm the chief. That's who he came to save. And guess what? In Matthew's book, he's not going to get very far. In fact, in the first chapter, he's going to say, his name shall be called Jesus, 121, for he shall save his people from their sins. He only gets in the first chapter, and he has to tell y'all something about Jesus. But you'll see, he couldn't even get past the first verse. 
Because when nobody else would accept him in the church, guess who accepted him? The leader of the church. Amen? Amen. He wasn't accepted in the Jewish church. But guess who called him? Jesus called him. That's why his book is filled with the kingdom and it's filled with grace because you and me may not recognize what that means. Because somehow, when we use the word dirty, do you think of yourself? You ride down the street and you see people and you say, oh, look at that dirty dude. You never hardly think of yourself as dirty, do you? You might say, I need to take a bath dirty, but you're not thinking heart dirty, right? Right? How about filthy? You ever think of yourself as filthy? Isn't that something? Do you ever think of yourself as uh, deceitful, scandalous, no good, unruly? How about nasty? <laughs> Just downright nasty. That's why we have problems giving. Because you know what the Bible ca calls you and me? Filthy, nasty, dirty, outcast, deceitful. All of those things you think you aren't, you are. The teacher this morning said, that lady, she was really bad. And I was thinking, that's all my mama said when I was little. You are bad. <laughs> I was bad, amen. And I'm still bad. But I got a good Savior. Amen? amen. Yes, you're not going to win people to Christ if you're trying to act like you're good. You're not good. You're not good. You may look good. But you can be just like the scribes and Pharisees. He said, outside in Matthew 23, you're white at sepulchers. You look good, but inside, you're full of dead man's bones. You don't have to lie to Jesus. You can be honest. Well, children, let me tell you a little bit about my badness because I wanted you to see how God, this is for you children so I can keep you with me. Sometimes we're preaching, we forget about the children. I'm not going to forget you. Amen. I was small like you before. Amen. And now I'm a big dude like Samson or something, right? Amen. It's a bad dude. Amen. So this is what I did. My mom had these nice gold rings. And my dad had some too, but his were so big I couldn't get them on my finger. So I said, let me use my mom's because hers were small. They were so pretty, shining with the diamonds on it. So I slid one on my finger, and it, it looked nice. So I slid another one on, and it got stuck. Oh. And I didn't know when a ring gets stuck on your hand, don't panic. Because your blood pressure rises, which will make your hand or fingers rise, and you're never going to get this ring off. Amen? So I'm struggling with that ring. <laughs> and I hear mama coming. So I really got to hurry up. And so I lock her door. And I go in the bathroom, and I get, under the, get in the sink, and I put water on it, and I'm pulling on the ring. And she's beating on the door, open this door, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know, I'll go, hold up, I'm using it. I was using it, right? Not using it, using it, but using it, right, right, right? <laughs> Amen. So I, I snatched it off finally, and it went down the drain. <sighs> Wise thinker, I didn't close the pop-up. So I didn't know what to do, and I looked around, I saw a shoe. And I saw underneath the sink, there was this thing looked like a pea. So I didn't have a wrench, so I took the shoe, and I started hitting to get the pea trapped off. And I missed, and then I hit, and then I missed, and then I hit. But when I was missing, I was hitting that water line at the back. And so I hit the pea trap this time, but on the way hitting the pea trap, I knocked the water line loose. Pea trap fell out. Ring fell down, but now there's water going everywhere. Amen. <laughs> so now I need a savior. Amen. Because I try to put towels under there in the water. <laughs> What's going on in there? Open the door. And I open the door. She shakes her head. I know what that means. I'm dead. Amen. <laughs> Well, she has to call the city, whatever, whatever. They turn the water off. But, of course, I got the beat down. Amen? 
I got the beat down. Secondly, this is for you children, just secondly, before I do this adult thing as well, but it's very simple. She had cologne or perfume, and I liked it, a gold thing again. That gold got to me, amen. <laughs> so I was messing with it. She had said, don't you mess with this. Don't you mess. Don't mint. Do to me, amen. I always take the NT off, amen. Do, do, do. So I grabbed it, and it was, I was short, so it was up there, and I pushed it to the edge. And I got it, and I was spraying it all on me. And then I went to put it back up there, and it tipped over and broke. Ping, ling, ling, ling. Well, that's that $100 perfume somebody was talking about this morning. Here I am again. Amen. In trouble. Here again, I hear. See, we had one of those hollow floor houses. She knew when it was too quiet, I was into something. Amen. So I hear her coming. I grab a towel. I start getting it all up, the glass and everything in the towel. And I'm looking, and she's coming. And I can hear her. What do I do? What do I do? And she's knocking again. So I run into the bathroom again. Not the sink this time. No, no, no. The toilet. It's a better place. Amen. So I throw the glass in the toilet, and I smell the towel. She's going to smell the towel. What do I do with the towel? I put it in the toilet. <laughs> Flush the toilet. Here's water again. Amen. It's the story of my life. Guess what my profession is right now? I'm a plumber. Amen? Amen? Do you see what God did with my badness? Right? Amen. I am a plumber now. I fixed that stuff. Amen. Pray. Isn't that wonderful? That's what Matthew's writing to you about. Amen. This God that saved me from what I was used me in spite of me. And I love him and I want everybody to love him. Amen. In spite of me. That was just two. I probably got 100,000. Amen. And I'm still alive, still kicking. Amen. That's why Matthew is so excited about Jesus. That's why he writes his book about Jesus. That's why he wants everybody to know he's the king. Because he can take an outcast, a nobody, a bad boy, a dirty guy, unclean, and make them clean. Amen. He can work you and work with me. And we still fail and fall and make mistakes. But guess what he's already done? And it doesn't seem like we like to tell people. He died for your sins. Somebody should have said, amen. amen. If he didn't, you would have to pay for him. Somebody else should have said, amen. See? Amen? Amen. He died for your sins. Let me throw a kicker in here. This one all will make somebody turn in their seat. Past sins, present sins, and future sins. Because he only gave one sacrifice. He's not going to offer another one. That one sacrifice had to cover past, before I was ever here, present while I'm here, and guess what else? Future. And I can show you that in Hebrews chapter 10, 14. By one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified by his blood. By his blood. One offering, y'all. That's what Hebrews tells us. By one sacrifice, this Jesus is able to take care of our salvation. Amen? Can you say amen? Amen. Okay, so go with me to Matthew right quick. I want you to see that he's introducing Jesus. I want you to see a few of the pictures of it. And then I want to close with our our scripture reading from chapter 4. So first off, Matthew 1, 1, check it out. Four titles are in the first verse. Four four titles. Matthew 1, 1, if you go there. And this is not, you don't usually read this. You know why? Because Matthew starts the New Testament off with a genealogy, which is his ancestry. And, And that's not interesting to us. But let me make it a little interesting to you. Because you like scandal, right? You like drama, right? You like drama? Girl, you know what happened over there? Dude, did you hear about that dude that did? You do, do. And you're on Facebook and you're doing all this. You love scandal, right? Well, so Matthew starts his book off with scandal, a genealogy. You say, that ain't scandalous. Yes, it is. 
because everybody in there is a, has a history of disgrace. And Jesus steps into their history and your history and brings grace so that our history of disgrace becomes a history of grace. Amen? Amen? He takes away your nasty, dirty, filthy history and gives you his history, a holy history, a heavenly history, a perfect history. Amen? He gets in your business, even if you don't want him to. God knows all about our struggles. You sing it, right? <laughs> he knows us well. Amen? He created you. So look at this. So Matthew writes his history because he wants you to see he's a king because he comes through the Davidic line and the Abrahamic line, and he shows it from Joseph's lineage, which is a legal lineage or a linear lineage, and Luke does a genealogy from the blood right lineage over in his book. Amen? But he wants you to see legally Jesus is the king. But I want you to see a little drama so I can keep you with me for a few minutes. Are you okay with that? I'm going to start with the women. Sorry, ladies. Amen? Is that all right? Verse 3. Go down there right quick before I give you those four titles in verse 1. Verse 3, Judas begot Perez and Zara of who? Tamar. Tamar, Tamar. If you would have read in your Bible in Genesis chapter 38, Tamar is a bad girl. <laughs> Amen? The guy before her, Judas, who she had the baby by, is her father-in-law. Is that enough drama for you? How did she get her father-in-law to make her pregnant? Oh, y'all need to go to Genesis 38 and read the story. Amen. <laughs> you read stuff like that every day on Facebook, right? Well, let me give you a little quickness about the story. So Tamar was married to one of his sons, and he died. He promised to give her another son because she needed a child to carry her birthright on, her name on. To she needed boys anyway because girls were no good in this culture. Sorry, ladies. Amen. You needed some boys to do the fields, to do some work. Amen. To protect the tribe. Not saying you women's women can't do it. Anyway, he didn't never give her that other son to marry. He was keeping him away from her. And he lost a wife. And he was so broken by losing his wife, Judas. He's one of Jacob's, uh, Joseph, Jacob's boy. He decides to go into a town to sleep with a prostitute to make him feel better after he lost his wife. That's drama, ain't it? Judas is going to sleep with a prostitute. He's in there, too. Y'all see Judas? It's in Genesis 38. See, now you want to go check that out, don't you? Amen. He went to sleep with a prostitute. She knew he had a history of going and sleeping with prostitutes. She dressed up like one, covered her face, hid herself, and she called him coming to town to sleep with a prostitute. And she said, you want to sleep with me, big boy? I will make you feel wonderful. And he said, yes. She said, before you do this, you got to give me something, you know, because he didn't have what he needed. She was really playing a trick on him. She made him give him a few things. That when he'd come back, he'd pay her what he promised he would pay her. And little did he know he got her pregnant, and that girl was Tamar. That's pretty devastating. This is Jesus. This is the, the, the family he's going to be born through. Y'all want to tell that story about your great-grandmama? <laughs> Do you want to tell that story about your great-grandmama? This one of his great-grandmamas. Amen? That's one of your great-grandmamas. That's one of y'all and me and us. Somebody ought to say, amen. Yeah. See, this is the problem, y'all. You will never love the good news until you can be honest about the bad news. You won't ever understand good news because you think you're good. Why do you need to be saved if you ain't done nothing? I ain't done as bad as they did. Yes, you have. 
Yes, you have. Some of you say, I hate liars. Then you hate yourself. <laughs> How many lies does it take before you think you're a liar? If you only told one lie in your life, I might let you off. That you're not a liar. But I guarantee you, everybody in here, even these children, maybe not all of them, <laughs> but many of them have told at least 100 lies. And I can tell y'all right now, if you done lied 100 times, you are a compulsive liar. <laughs> Amen. Y'all said, this dude here, I, heard, I hope he hurry up and finish. Amen. I just started. You got 20 more minutes at least. <laughs> Amen. I ain't through with you yet. Amen. I just started because you got to get some bad news to get some good news. Amen. Look at where Tamar and Judas are. They in his family. He born through these people to bring grace to what? Our disgrace. The story goes when Judas finds out Tamar is pregnant, he says, let's burn her. That's what he said. Let's burn her. What about the dude who sleeps with prostitutes? Should we burn him? No, he don't want to be burned, but he says, let's burn her. She says, before he burn me, tell him to come talk to me. And he had gave her three objects. She said, you probably want this bracelet. bracelet. You probably want this staff. And you probably want this stuff. And it dawned on him. This the woman I slept with. I got her pregnant. And he said, you are a better woman than me. Amen. And he had to back up out of that. Amen. Do you all understand? That's the history. Okay. That's not it. Can I mention one more or two? Okay. Y'all right? Y'all with me? Move down a few verses to verse 5. Verse 5, Salmon begot Boaz of Rahab. Y'all know Rahab? Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Rahab is a whore. The Bible says harlot, so y'all like that better, right? Right? Rahab's there, right? Why y'all looking at pastor? It's in the Bible. <laughs> it's in the Bible, amen. Pastor, you gonna let him talk like that in church? It's in the Bible. Rahab is a what? Harlot? Do you all know how happy she is to know she included in this? Rahab got pregnant by somebody in here. Look who she got pregnant by, Boaz. If it weren't for a genealogy, she wouldn't have knew Boaz was the next in kin. Boaz got her pregnant. He had Obed, Obed, Jesse, and Jesse had King David. I'm sorry, by Ruth, but I, I skipped and got down to Ruth. <laughs> sorry about that. Amen. But guess who's there? What was her name? Who was that name I just used before, Ruth? Rahab. Y'all looked in Joshua 2, 1? Oh, huh? I'm sorry. She's a harlot. A whore. Ruth, a Moabite. Do y'all know how the Moabites came about? Put up there Genesis 18, 37, 38, if you would, right quick. Genesis 18. Go there with me. Let me let you see who the Moabites are where Ruth comes from. She's a Moabitess. And then I'm going to move on. I got a lot to cover in a few minutes. I'm going to quit. A history of grace. But I want you to see this. Genesis is the first book, so you can get there quick, right? Amen? Genesis 18, or Genesis 19. Well, I, I don't know. I lost it. Genesis 19, 37 and 38. Uh, sorry, I said 18, but it's 19. Look at 19. Uh, 37. Y'all with me? So Lot, verse 36 says, both of Lot's daughters ended up with children or with child, pregnant. And the firstborn had a son, and he called his name what? Moab. Moab. Which the Moabites come from. And guess what Ruth was? A Moabite. Not supposed to be even married, be able to marry an Israelite, but did. Amen. The Moabites come from Lot sleeping with his two daughters. That's incest. It's wrong. Amen. Boy, y'all look shocked. You know why the Bible has these stories? Because y'all like drama. You like drama. 
You like to talk about. You see her, she thinks she was pretty. Did you hear what that joker said? Look how he looking at them people. He looking at women. You love drama. You spread it all the time. You watch uh, uh, the, the ladies that sit on there, the view. Guys, y'all watch stuff, you know. You love it. Hey, they trading what you call. He ain't no good player anyway. He better than you. What you talking about? Drama. <laughs> Drama. I would have traded him a long time ago. I trade you. Amen. <laughs> what you talking about, Joker? Amen. We love Drama. The Bible's filled with it. Amen, right? Come on now. <laughs> so I'll just do this and leave that alone for now because you, you all stuck on that thing. You're scared. Of <laughs> this dude, here's something wrong with him. Because later, uh, for the men, it names David. And it brings another woman in there with David's name in that chapter 1. We're going back there. It says, David, the one who had married this lady who he had her husband Uriah killed. The king slept with another a married woman, got her pregnant, and couldn't trick her husband into sleeping with her, so he had him killed to cover. He's the king. He's a murderer. He's in there too. Amen? That's grace. Do you all see it? I, listen, it's a few people in my family I don't like. <laughs> I didn't say I don't love. <laughs> I said what? I don't like them. My house, five and a half acres, I stay on a ranch, and I invited my cousin who didn't have a place to stay with her four children to come stay with me, and I figured out where hell comes from. Hell was not created by God. It was created by humans. Amen. Because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And heaven and earth were united, and humans brought hell. Amen. Because I was living in Eden on my ranch, and here come my cousin and her four children. And I see what hell is like. Amen. And I don't want to be there. Amen. They tore up everything at my house. When they finished, I had about six or $7,000 of damage plus my neighbor's stuff. Amen. And I could only deal with them for two months. Amen. And I took them to McKinney and got rid of them. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God is a good God. Isn't he? Amen. That's where it comes from. Drunk. So I don't like everybody in my family, and you don't either. But if your great-grandmama was a whore, you wouldn't go around telling people. If your other grandmama was born from incest, you wouldn't tell those stories. Jesus has it in his genealogy to let you all know he brings grace to our disgrace. Amen. He brings the love of God in spite of how ungodly we are to our lives to change us and transform us. Amen. Because if love can't change you, ain't nothing can change you. Amen. Money will only change you for a little bit. Amen. Y'all know it. Y'all know how to fake for money. Come on now. Amen. I'll leave that one alone. Go back to Matthew right quick. Let me move through it real quick. So I'm going to have to do it from my mind. I want you to see the scriptures. But if you look at Matthew, it's first chapter is in two sections, 1 through 17, 18 through 25. 18 through 25, we call it the Christmas story. It's not a Christmas story. It's a story full of drama. An unmarried woman, an unplanned pregnancy, and an implausible explanation. I'm pregnant, Joseph, who she's uh, engaged to, but I'm pregnant by the Holy Ghost. You think, <laughs> you think drama again, right? God is coming into human history this time, not just to be with us, but to be in us. Amen? The scandal of this story is not immorality in verses 18 through 25. The scandal is that human beings can become pregnant with God. That's the scandal. He comes in through a scandalous way. Amen? How do you tell your man you, you pregnant by the Holy Ghost? And you know what Joseph was going to do? Put her away. <laughs> Amen? But what looks clear in the day and through the eyes of others 
can look better at night when the Holy Ghost speaks to your heart. Amen. And he planned in the morning to dismiss her. But God sent an angel to tell him, the child she's carrying, no, it's not yours, but it is a child of God. It is of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And he kept her. Amen. That's drama, isn't it? You know why it's drama, man? Because if you keep a woman and everybody knew she's already pregnant before y'all got married, they say you a fool. Y'all know y'all talk like that, right? Come on, brothers. Amen. Come on, brothers. Amen. Nair and Joseph should have known better. And look at him. He's so stupid. He's going to take her and she just doesn't got her. She don't care about him. Blah. See, y'all love drama. Here it is. Amen. The greatest drama in all history. Haven't even made the news that God was born of a virgin woman who not slept with her husband. And that's drama. Amen. But you and I can be now become pregnant with God. If you'll invite him into your hearts, he'll come inside of you and begin to grow. Amen? That's how Matthew starts his introduction. Chapter 2, he uses prophecy to introduce Jesus. And I could go through it. He says, send me your location, wherever y'all been, wherever you come from. I've been there. Bethlehem, Matthew 2, 6, I've been there. Matthew 2, 15, Hosea, quotes of prophecy, out of Egypt have I brought my son. Jesus says, I've been there, y'all. Amen. I've been to Bethlehem where there is rejection. I've been to Egypt where you can be in idolatry. I've been there wherever you and I could go. He quotes uh, Matthew 2, 17 and 18 from Jeremiah 31, 15, where there will be weeping. And he, all of these prophecies come together at his birth. Matthew brings them in as a testimony to show you prophetically Jesus is king. Chapter 3, he uses a forerunner, John the Baptist, who announces that Jesus is the Messiah king, the Savior king. And at the end of the book, after using John the Baptist at the beginning of the book, at the end of the book, verses 16 and 17, he uses, he's filled with the Holy Ghost. And then a voice speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If God has to tell you that Jesus is his son, ask him, and he'll tell you too. Amen. He'll speak it to your heart, brothers and sisters. Amen. Chapter 4, to show you all spiritually, he's the king. He goes into the wilderness and tempted of the devil, never fail. And he's doing all of this to become your savior. He's doing all of this for you and me. Amen. He goes in the wilderness, overcomes the devil. And you know what he tells you and me right now? Because you're praying, Lord, get the devil off my job. Lord, get the devil out of my house. You know what Jesus tells you now in James 4, 7? He says, you can submit yourselves to God or humbly give yourselves to God. And guess what he says? You can resist the devil. And guess what will happen? He'll flee from you. You can do what? Resist the devil. Here you are pleading with God. Get the devil out. You know what God says? Resist him. You have the power and the authority to resist him because I give it to you. Amen. In Luke 10, 19, he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on the heads of serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Nothing. Nothing. You can tread on serpents. You can tread on scorpions. And nothing shall by any means harm you. In chapters 5 through 7, Matthew shows you that Jesus is a new Moses by his theological teaching. He teaches the Sermon on the Mount, some of the most powerful teaching you will ever hear. He qualifies to be our king because he said, You have heard it said in old times, thou shalt not, but I say unto you. Power and authority in his teaching. He's the new teacher. Amen. In chapters 8 and 9, Matthew gives you nine healings to let you see Jesus has the power to be your king. He heals a leper. He heals a centurion servant. He heals a lady who has a fever. Amen. Walks off of there and gets on a boat and stops a storm. So he has power over disease, power over natural elements. Gets out of a boat, boat after stopping a hurricane and goes on an island where men are, have dip demons, where they say we got a legion of demons, 10,000 demons maybe, and he heals them. 
He has power over the supernatural. And then he goes right on, brothers and sisters. A man who has palsy, he says, your sins are forgiven. And they said, we don't believe you can forgive sins. He said, man, so they'll know my words have power. Get up off that bed. And the man gets up to show us if he has power to get a man up who's been crippled. He has power to say, your sins be forgiven you. Power over sin. And light, last but not least, he raises somebody from the dead. I think, y'all, he ought to be our king. Amen? Amen? And you know what he says to us in the passage we had this morning in Matthew chapter 4? Come, follow me. Now, you may ask, where are we going? Because, y'all, even from a child, when they get you in the car, and they say, get in the car and let's go. Children, you can hear them. Where are we going? What do that matter? Amen. You can't drive. You ain't got no money. You ain't nobody. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Amen. Where are we going? You're not going to look around anyway because you got a cell phone. You don't know where we're going. Shut your mouth. Amen. And then Jesus says, come follow me. And guess what we want to ask him? Where are we going? Where are we going? And if he said, I'm going to take you over here, you'll say, I don't think I want to go over there. Amen. That's because we don't know who the me is yet. Because it's not, it's really not something you should even, because if you look at the calling of these people, when he calls them, it says, and immediately they left. You know why? Because they didn't care where they were going. They knew who they were going with. And he mattered more to them than where they were going. Amen. And if y'all, we're going to be united, number one, a prayer is born out of this. He says, follow me. We need to know who we're following. Amen? And he's worth us following it. One of the issues you're having giving to the church is you think you're giving to the church because that's the way they keep saying it. But let your giving be to Jesus. Amen? Let your giving be for his mission, his purpose, and his glory. Amen? And if you if you're a cheapskate, amen, a cheapskate, Lord have mercy. Oh my God, let me shut up. Amen. Let me just do this. Listen, let's pray together. And these are three prayers. I just want to say this: We're following the me. All of us need to remember we're followers. Amen. And number three, he says, all of us. We always say the Great Commission. I saw it on our church mission out here. He says the Great Commission starts with the initial call. In Matthew chapter 4, when he calls the first people, he says, come follow me and what? I'm going to make you what? Fishers of men. What was the purpose of calling them? To make them disciples. To make them go get other people. Amen? The purpose in calling us is the exact same. Amen? He calls you as a disciple, and then you go make disciples. Let me share it with you this way. Ladies, if you meet a guy, and he's the one, y'all know the one? Girl, he the one. And men, if y'all meet a lady, and y'all think she the one, guess what happens? You start telling people about him. Is that right? Girl, look at this dude. Isn't he handsome? Look at that. And then some of y'all get afraid because y'all think if you show them to somebody, they're going to take them from you. Amen. (laughs) Amen. So maybe that wasn't a good illustration. (laughs) The point is, if it's somebody you love or care about or you think you love or care about, you'll tell somebody about them. Is that right? Amen. So I think if we find out how much we care or love Jesus, we will tell somebody about him. Amen. Amen. So let's pray that God will unite us through grace because the guys he called and the grace in the gospel, the guys he called had nothing in their hands to bring, nothing that should have made him want them. They had nothing to offer him like you and me have nothing to offer him, but he calls us. So we're all united in the grace. So when y'all look around and you start saying, he need to sit down, you do too. He need to shut up, you do too. Amen? Because guess what? The worst thing you can find in anybody in here, you are the same. Because guess what we all are? In the gospel, it says all of us are sinners. Do you all know what that means? It doesn't say his sin worse than her sin. No, 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 no. A sinner means what? 
sin. You can forget about what I've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. You're a sinner, and you need a Savior, which means no need to look around. We, we don't have to unite on music. Music ain't going to unite us. We don't have to unite on some of these other things. It's not going to. What we need to be united on is the grace of God from, presented to us through the gospel message that we are all sinners and we all need to be saved by grace. Number two, we need to be praying that God will give us the ability and God will use every one of us to carry out his mission. What is his mission? To make disciples. And number three, we all need to come to the place where we're willing to give up everything, what we are and what we have. For Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew in his parables, and I close here in 1344, he gives a parable of a man walking through a field, and he's walking along, and this happened to me before, and not quite like that, but he finds some gold or a treasure, and he sees, and he, he oh, oh, he said, wow, look at this. He looks around. Nobody sees it. He covers it back up, and he says, I have to buy this field. And he goes back home. He says, I got to sell everything I have. And the people say, why are you selling everything you have? He says, I'm going to buy this field. And they look at that field and they said, you stupid. You're crazy. Why would you buy that field? He says, I got a hunch. I got a hunch. And he sells everything he has because he's willing to lose everything to get that field. Because guess what he knows? It's a treasure buried in that field. Amen? It's just a parable. You know what the parable is? Jesus is the treasure buried in the field. The field is the world. He came to the world, and here he is, and he offers himself to you and me. But you know what you got to do to get him? He says, if any man come out to me, Luke 9, 23, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You got to give up everything. Because if you value something more than him, don't y'all know the devil will get you off track with that? Amen? Jesus will keep you, but the devil will keep you off track with whatever you value more than him. Amen? And you'll learn it the hard way or the easy way. Amen? So I was walking one day, and I found a gold nugget. Nice, fat gold nugget. Walking across the parking lot with my dad. I said, Dad, look at this. He said, boy, that ain't nothing. I said, Dad, why would you kill my vision like that? Amen. I want to think it's something. Amen. He said, boy, you think somebody would have lost something if it was valuable? I said, I don't care. I'm keeping it. Amen. I put that thing in my pocket, and we was riding. And he says, you kept that thing? I said, why are you worried about it? <laughs> it's in my pocket. Amen. He said, you kept that thing? I said, yeah, I kept it. And so we was riding along, I pulled that thing out, and I was looking at it. You see, it was a fat rock, amen. Fell off somebody's necklace, probably a big old hunk of gold, amen. I liked it, praise God. And I was looking at where we was riding. He said, boy, you wasting your time, you stupid. I said, man, it sure is bothering you that I got something that ain't valuable in my pocket. Why is that bothering you, amen? I was a little old enough to talk to my dad a little bit like that. We had a great relationship, amen. So he says, I said, well, I tell you what, dad, since you, can't, you seem to can't be able to get us to the house without word, so word, stop at the pawn shop and let's check it out. So we stop at a pawn shop and I take it in there to the desk. I said, check this out and tell me if it's gold. He says, oh, I'll give you $5 for it. I said, I didn't ask you to give me nothing for it. I asked you to check it and see if it's gold. He said, I'll give you 10 I said, no, check it. So he goes over there. He looked. I don't know why you're wasting your time. I said, you sound like my daddy. Amen. <laughs> why everybody want me to throw my nugget away? Amen. I said, check it. And he checks it, a little acid or something. Oh, well, I'll give you 50 for it. Oh, 10, 5, 10, now 50, huh? Uh, uh, no. Uh, well, maybe I, the highest I can go maybe is 100. I said, no, give me my nugget back. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let me tell y'all something. I took that nugget to the right place, and I got me $1,500 for it. Amen. You hear me? Amen. $1,500. You know what God was telling me? Brothers and sisters, when you find Jesus, and let me change the story, because none of us have ever found him. According to the story of Matthew, he finds us. And he says to every one of us today, Come, 
follow me, and I will do something for you that you'll never be the same. Amen. God bless you today, and may he keep you is my prayer. Amen.